true sustainability, cultivating a repentant pro-future, that is indigenous, heart and mind. I'm Michael Dowd, and I'm recording this on Thanksgiving weekend of 2022. And I think that having the sustainability and indigenous and Thanksgiving theme is a good one, because if there's anything that typifies truly indigenous thinking and feeling, it's being grateful for all things. I love this quote from a very famous uh, indigenous elder uh, author, Vine Deloria. Somewhere in the planetary history, religious expression changed from participation in the sound, color, and rhythm of nature to the abstractions of man outside this context, pleading for temporary respite and hoping in the next life to return to the garden. Loyal Rue is probably the most uh, famous philosopher of religion alive today. Uh, he's written a number of books. One of them is called Religion is Not About God. And what he means is that religion is about our relationship to reality. And yes, reality has been personified as the various gods and goddesses. But if religion is doing its job, it's to help us live in right relationship to what's fundamentally, undeniably, and inescapably real. I love this quote. The most profound insight in the history of humankind is that we should seek to live in accord with reality. Indeed, living in harmony with reality may be accepted as a formal definition of wisdom. If we live at odds with reality, foolishly, we will be doomed. But if we live in proper relationship with reality, wisely, we may be saved. Robin Wall Kimmerer, who has already been quoted and is certainly one of my more significant indigenous teachers, talks about the four R's of right relationship to reality. These are respect, responsibility, reciprocity, and reverence. And each and all of these are required for living in right relationship to reality. That's both true collectively as well as individually. Respect, responsibility, reciprocity, and reverence. And it's interesting, even the famous, uh, very famous um, Chinese scholar, uh, Confucius was asked by his students, teacher, could you sum up the essence of your teaching in the most concise way? And he said, I can do it in one word, reciprocity. I want to remind us of what it is that all humans throughout all of history at all times in all cultures have needed to not go crazy, to basically be sane and to have healthy lives and healthy relationships. These are universal human needs. I originally got most of this list from Dave Pollard, but here are the other scholars that uh, this work is based on. So we all need a habitable climate and healthy, non-toxic air, water, food, and shelter. We need to belong to and connect with a safe and engaging community, starting with attachment to one's mother in the critical first years of life. The need for meaning and purpose in one's life, including meaningful work. The need to be valued, appreciated, and heard. The need to feel secure about the future for oneself and one's loved ones. The need for control and a degree of autonomy over one's life and work. The need to be in regular intimate communion with the living world. The need for a sense of place and home. And the need for freedom from chronic stress, financial, physical, etc., and the time and space to recover from it, including getting adequate sleep. Now, the most important thing to notice about this particular list is that these were all met in spades in genuinely sustainable indigenous cultures. And most of these are not met in one way or another in human-centered civilizations rather than life-centered cultures, human-centered civilizations, most of these are not met. In an industrial civilization, most of them are definitely not met. And so it's not a surprise. It's like a caged animal. We all exhibit dysfunction because we are born into and live within a dysfunctional, non-sustainable, unfaithful culture. So I use the word unfaithful. Sustainable means faithful unsustainable means unfaithful. And I suggest that everything else is but a footnote 
or a distraction. Now, faithful to who? Faithful to what? Well, faithful to the past, faithful to the ancestors, faithful to the descendants. That's the whole seventh generation. Faithful to the body of life, which is our biophysical creator, sustainer, and end. Faithful to nature, what we call nature, but the word nature is not a good one. So sustainable means faithful and unsustainable means unfaithful. Faithful to reality and unfaithful to reality. And the bottom line, and nobody's going to like this, you all will probably find this repulsive and unacceptable. Unfortunately, it's true. It's way too late for civilization to become faithful, but it's not too late for you as individuals. So just to let you know where I'm coming from, I'm a religious naturalist. Taking nature to heart is our uh, sort of byline. And all indigenous, truly sustainable cultures had what I call it, what I'm calling an eco-theo worldview. That is where the ecos, the living world was related to as divine, as an expression or incarnation or revelation of divinity, our biophysical creator, sustainer, and end. And the theos, the world of spirit and, 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 and theology and that was infused and embodied and, and expressed within the living world. It's an eco-theo worldview. Ecology is the heart of my theology. In fact, here's my eco-theo credo, and this most religious naturalists uh, subscribe to something like this. Reality is my God. And notice I spell God G, Earth, M O G D because I want to be clear. I'm not meaning a supernatural being outside the universe that if you believe in this supernatural being, you're a theist, and if you disbelieve in this supernatural being, you're an atheist. No, I'm an eco-theist, right? By, I honor my biophysical creator, sustainer, and end, and I invite you to do the same. So reality is my God. Evidence is my scripture. The epic of evolution is my creation story. Ecology is my theology. Integrity is my spiritual path. And evangelizing right relationship to reality is my message, my mission. And that's my core message, too. And when I say evangelizing, I mean sharing the message that Coming into coming home, coming into right relationship to reality is good news. And that's true even if we go extinct in the not too distant future, which is an absolute possibility. What do we call this reality? That which brought everything into being, that which nourishes and sustains everything, and that which receives everything at its end. This is, you don't have to believe in this reality. It's an escapable reality. But what do we call it? Well, what we call reality, what we call nature what we call the biosphere, indigenous, that is faithful, sustainable, pro-future cultures experienced personally and related to in an I thou, respectful, honorable way. Remember the four R's? Respect, reciprocity, reverence, and responsibility. That's the way we do, but we have to think about that reality. Joseph Brodsky said our language matters. He, he won the Nobel Prize in uh, literature in 1987. He was a a Russian polymath that taught at some of the most prestigious universities in, in North America. And he said, you, know, you Americans are so naive. You think evil is going to come into your houses wearing big black boots. It doesn't happen like that. Look at the language. It begins in the language. We need to untrivialize or realize moral language. And this is, again, an indigenous critique of Western or just even anthropocentric. Because good and evil, it, it's not relative. It's not just context dependent. Good is what promotes ecological integrity, social coherence, and personal wholeness, usually in that order. Evil is what diminishes or destroys ecological integrity, social coherence, or personal wholeness. This is not moral rocket science. We don't need Ten Commandments to tell us this. So coming back to language... There are words and concepts that foster individual and collective evil. And again, I'm meaning evil simply as these words and concepts foster us to be in a, a, a way of relating to primary reality that diminishes or degrades ecological integrity, social coherence, and personal wholeness. First of all, clean, green, and renewable. These are deceptive words. The only energy, the only technology that's clean, green, and truly renewable has chlorophyll. If it doesn't have chlorophyll, it's not clean, it's not green, and it's not renewable. It may be rebuildable, but it's not renewable. Progress. We think of progress in human-centered ways, but that's crazy. Two of the most important books, two of my most important mentors are William Catton 
and Thomas Berry. And both of them, in fact, Overshoot's the most important book I've ever read in my life. And both of these get at this, you can't define progress in human-centered ways without it becoming ecocidal. William Catton says, human society is inextricably part of a global biotic community. And in that community, human dominance has had and is having self-destructive consequences. Thomas Berry, one of the most significant ecological and evolutionary thinkers of the 20th century, said something along similar lines. He said, the most difficult transition to make is from a human-centered to a life-centered norm of progress. If there's to be any true progress, the entire life community must progress. Any so-called progress of the human at the expense of the larger life community must ultimately lead to a diminishment of human life itself. Sustainable and development. We use the word sustainable all the time. The, the, you know, the, I actually met somebody who claimed to be the sustainability director for the, for the United States Pentagon. He's more unsustainable than the Pentagon, and he was the sustainable. He was in charge of recycling. You know, okay. Development. We think of development as a positive term, but it usually means taking the living world, making stuff for humans, and then go to the waste heap. And the faster that happens, that's development. This is crazy. Evolved. Energy transition. No, these are not going to happen. And God. The fundamental word that if interpreted in a human-centered way leads good people to do great evil is interpreting the word God in human-centered ways. And I, I'm not going to go into more. I've done a number of programs, God owning our error, accepting our fate, sustainability 101, indigenuity is not optional. Indigenuity is applying an indigenous heart and mind to today's issues. My God, what have we done? That was spoken by the co-pilot of the Enola Gay when they dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. My God, what have we done? And then my 10 Inevitables, my most complete video that I've ever done, and my most recent one, Collapse and Ecocide as Religious okay. Failure, God Blind and Biosphere Deaf. So the limits of my language mean the limits of my world. This is why language matters so much, because your God is your ultimate concern. It's whatever you put your faith or trust in. And if we don't put our faith and trust in that reality first, what we could call the ecosphere, right? That's our biophysical, our universal creator, sustainer, and end. Doesn't matter whether you believe in the biosphere or the ecosphere, it's, it's, it's our creator, sustainer, and end. But our name for that reality either evokes humility or hubris. For example, if we call that reality God, G, Earth, emoji, D, or merely the environment, notice, just the name itself fosters either humility or hubris. I love the ancient Greek definition of hubris, the overweening pride of the doomed. So what's a God's eye view? We think of it in human-centered ways as like the view above and outside it all, that sees it all. Well, no, I suspect, I tell you that this is a God's eye view. A God's eye view of the world is the view from within every set of eyes. It includes the subjective experience of all creatures. That's what's known as a kin-centric worldview, where the, the other creatures are seen as kin. So uh, this should be considered religion 101 or sustainability 101. That is, religion is that aspect of society in healthy cultures, which it hasn't been doing for several thousand years, but religion is that aspect of society that speaks with moral authority and, and assures that the future will not be compromised by the present. Because if religion doesn't do that, no other institution is going to do that. And in traditional societies, this is a very famous book by Teddy, uh, Teddy Goldsmith, Edward Goldsmith. He was the founder and the editor of the Ecologist magazine uh, and the editor for like 40 years. Uh, and his magnum opus is The Way, an ecological worldview. In fact, this is from the table of contents in The Way. He said, in traditional societies, in healthy, genuinely sustainable pro-future societies, technology is in accord with the needs of the biosphere. Settlements are in accord with the needs of the biosphere. The economy, education, community, basically everything is in accord with the needs of the biosphere, which is primary reality. So it turns out that religion needs science. That's why I love Neil deGrasse Tyson. Religion needs science and evidence needs a moral voice. And this can happen. This won't happen when the biosphere is exploited as it rather than honored as thou.
And that, again, makes sense when you remember the nested nature of reality. We're made up of smaller, intelligent, creative realities like our microbiome that we don't exist without. And we are dependent upon larger, creative, intelligent realities like the algae and the trees and the climate. And so all of this is what I call primary reality is everything inside us and everything outside us that we depend on that we don't exist without. Relate to the larger body of life as divine or perish. You could say that's a fundamental law of life. Or relate to the community of life as kin or perish. This is an indigenous, pro-future heart and mind. I love this quote from the Native American elder Daniel Wildcat. He says, we live among relatives, not resources. And Thomas Berry said something similar. The universe is a communion of subjects, not a collection of objects. The environment, after all, is not our surroundings. It's our biophysical creator, sustainer, and end. So just very quickly, sustainable means faithful. For the first 95% of human history, we live more or less faithfully, more or less sustainably. And it's the essential stance of virtually all pro-future, ecocentric, that is life-centered, kin-centric or land-honoring cultures. That's the fundamental difference. Unsustainable is the land belongs to us. Sustainable is we belong to the land. So wealth and well-being is measured by the year-by-year, decade-by-decade health and vitality of the soil, the forest, the water, the life, and everything the culture or society needs and depends. In other words, it's honoring nature, honoring God, G Earth Emoji D, honoring the living world, and doing everything you can to preserve the systems that make your life possible. What I'm calling God first. Unsustainable means unfaithful. It means exploitative. It's extractive. It's man first. And I say man rather than human because most unsustainable civilizations are not just anthropocentric. They're androcentric. They're man-centered. This is just the last 5% of human history, the last 8,000 years. The elites and the ruling class, the well be what, get what gets called wealth and progress goes up, at least for the elites and ruling class, not for the slaves. And the well-being of the bioregion and the habitat that is carrying capacity, that's an ecological term, or real wealth goes down. And where those cross is what's called overshoot. And this is the ecocidal pattern of more than 80 human-centered, that is anthropocentric civilizations. I do whole programs just on this kind of thing. So religion, as Teddy Goldsmith says, is the control mechanism. What he means is that, that it's that moral voice within society that ensures that the future will not be compromised by the present. And here are three fundamental things that unite virtually every sustainable culture that we know of. All benefits and all real wealth come from the living biosphere, what I'm calling God. Right? Again, not God as a supernatural being, but God as a mythic proper name for the living world, our biophysical creator, sustainer, and end. God or life will continue to dispense these benefits and wealth only if life's critical order, that's, that is its essential integrity or way, is honored and preserved. Therefore, the fundamental role of religion or life ways is to ensure that the culture or society remains faithful, faithful to the past, faithful to the future, and faithful to the body of life by fiercely preserving the integrity of the ecosphere and the critical order of the cosmos. And there were four basic fundamental ways that they did this. God first, or life first, seventh generation, sacred limits, and consequence capture. I call these the four laws of true sustainability. God first, seventh generation, sacred limits, and consequence capture. And I have the exclamation because this is the passion with which genuinely sustainable cultures speak about our relationship to the living world. This is an ecocentric, not human. I mean, it's it's it, it's it's not human centered. It's not anthropocentric. It's ecocentric or life centered measures of progress and well being, not human centered. GDP, gross domestic product, the wealth of kings and corporations and nations, all of those are insane and ecocidal measures of wealth, well being, success, and progress. Failing to prioritize the future over the present is evil. Material grace limits are real and must be honored. There's a limit to how much we can take from the living world and a limit to how much waste we can exude to the living world before the, the, the natural systems that we depend upon start breaking down. That's known as carrying capacity. That's our, it's, I call them grace limits. And then consequence capture the impacts for good or ill 
must be mirrored back. The fact that an individual or corporation can get wealthy, mega wealthy, in ways that diminish and destroy everything we depend upon is absolute insanity. So the unsustainable mindset is try to improve upon God in all ways. Now, that obviously makes no sense by using the word God. But if you put nature there, little n, not even capitalize it, try to improve upon nature in all ways. Well, of course, those of us in civilizations assume we can do that. We look at the benefit of our lives and we say, well, of course we can do that. And the sustainable mindset is to try to honor God, try to honor our biophysical creator, sustainer, and end in all ways. So let me just wind down by coming back to this theme of cultivating a repentant, pro-future heart and mind. And I, I, I dropped the word indigenous here because I'm a white guy. I'm an Irishman. You know, who am I to speak about what an indigenous heart and mind? I mean, I try to be faithful to that, and I certainly have many indigenous teachers and, and mentors and elders, but I'm just going to say that here are some of the things that I consider essential for cultivating a repentant, pro-future heart and mind. And by simply repentant, all I mean is to say, I thought this was the truth. I thought this was the way we were supposed to go. We as a society thought this was the way to go. And to repent is to simply admit publicly we were wrong. I was wrong. And now we see this is the path. So first is to repent of human centeredness and to come home to life, come home to God, come home to a kin-centric worldview. We can all nurture that no matter how old. We, we may die next week. We're maybe 95 years old. We can all come home to reality in some unique way for ourselves. And we can do that by remembering who and what we are, who and what you are, that you are the universe becoming conscious of itself, that you are immortal, that you will die and our species will go extinct at some point, maybe soon, maybe, maybe not, but we're mortal. And then to honor when and where you are. We are in the decline of a civilization. We're not in the expansion. Most of us grew up during the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. We were in expansion, but no, it shifted, and we're now in decline, and we're in precipitous decline when you look at the impact on the biosphere. So honoring that we're in a time of global hospice, we're in a time of contraction, we're in a time of decline, and to honor where you are. You're in Gettys, most of you are in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. To honor that fact and to honor your landforms and you know all the water and the soil and the, where the, the plants and animals of your place, to honor that to simplify. We can all cultivate a pro-future heart and mind by simplify, simplify, simplify. I first heard about less, L-E-S-S, -S, from John Michael Greer. John Michael Greer is, a, uh, uh, is an author, and he talks about we can all adapt to less, less energy, less stuff, less stimulation. And our souls are nourished when we do that. And I added the less with a lisp. I added the final S because we can all be committed to less suffering. We can be committed to, to lessening the suffering of others, human and non-human. To bless and to contribute to others, human and non-human. My wife, Connie, is one of the world's, one of North America's leading point people in terms of assisting trees in migrating north. It's called assisted migration. It's a whole movement of assisting trees in migrating faster than any other animal can move their seeds. In fact, all you've got to do is Google the Wikipedia page, Assisted Migration of Forests in North America, and you can learn all about this incredibly important movement to contribute to other species, even if we go extinct. And again, this is the fundamental indigenous heart and mind is to be thankful of all things. And one of the things that means is let go of judgment and guilt. Let go of, oh, I think I spelled judgment wrong. Let go of judgment in ourselves and others because we, we so often feel so righteous and so judgmental of others. We judge the fossil fuel companies. We judge those other, the other political party. We judge ourselves. You know, if we fly to go see our grandkids, we can let go of all that. It's too late for those judgments. And we can find ways to be a blessing, to be a contribution, to have compassion and generosity for others given the reality of our situation. I love this quote from Robert Louis Stevenson. Sooner or later, we all sit down to a banquet of consequences. That's true individually, and it's especially true collectively. 
That's the Great Reckoning. We're in the early stages of the Great Reckoning, and there's no stopping it. It's unstoppable. But I believe this can also be the Great Homecoming. Humanity, the prodigal species, we've squandered our inheritance, and at least some of us are coming home to reality. We're nurturing a repentant, pro-future, indigenous heart and mind. And that is sacred, holy work, even if we go extinct in the not-too-distant future, which is an absolute possibility. I love this quote, again, coming back to full circle to Robin Wall Kimmer. Uh, this, is, this is me, actually, at uh, Redwood Grove out in California. I love this quote. Robin is the author of Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants. It was written seven years ago, and it's still on the New York Times bestseller list. It's like number nine or 10 right now. And then it's also available in her own audio voice. And I encourage the chapters, because she records it herself, will bring you to tears over and over and over again. I love this quote. Action on behalf of life transforms. Because the relationship between self and the world is reciprocal, it's not a question of first getting enlightened or saved and then acting. As we work to heal the earth, the earth heals us. So let me just say just one or two things from my heart. I am well aware that some of what I shared is unacceptable, repulsive, difficult, to say the least. Especially if you, like many of us, have had the belief that if we just transform our systems, vote the right people in, shift to renewables, you know, wind, wind and solar, if we just get enough of us to do that, then we can save civilization. Most of us believe that, and some of us still do. And so if you wake up tomorrow morning and you think, Michael Dowd is crazy, I can't accept what he had to say. Apply the meat and bones principle. This maybe isn't as good for vegans and vegetarians as it is meat eaters, but the meat and bones principle is be nourished by whatever I said that's nourishing and just discard the bones. Just don't worry. it. Don't choke on the bones. Just let go of whatever I said that you disagree with or you find repulsive or unacceptable and just take the meat that's there. And I encourage us all to support each other in growing in compassion but also growing in those four R's of right relationship to reality that Robin Wall Kimmer talks about. Respect, reverence, reciprocity, and responsibility. Thank you.